President Biden met with Republican senators last week at the White House, raising hopes of a possible compromise on at least part of his infrastructure package. Earlier today, we sat down with Republican Senator Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania and went through what is on the table and what is not. We had a constructive meeting with the president on Thursday. Uh, there were six of us in the White House with the president, the vice president, and the secretaries of transportation and commerce. And what I was encouraged by is we were very candid with the president about what could possibly get Republican support. And he understood that. So first of all, when we think about infrastructure, we're not talking about expanding the welfare state. That's a different category, different conversation. What we're talking about are the platforms and systems and things we use to move people and goods and services the way most people think of infrastructure. So roads, bridges, airports, waterways, the traditional infrastructure. So that's our list. Now, there's overlap with the president. It's just that his list extends well beyond that. If the president is willing to work with us where we agree, that's, that's step number one. That's very constructive. Step number two is we're not going to pay for this by undoing what we think was the most constructive tax reform in at least a generation. And, you know, after the 2017 tax reform went into effect, just before the pandemic hit, we literally had the best economy of my lifetime. Full employment, rising wages, narrowing income gap. I mean, more job openings than there were people looking for work. It was as good as it ever gets, and I'd like to get back to that. I don't think you get there by undoing the tax reform that helped us. So that that's one. That's that's not on the table in, in our proposal. Um, but I also don't want to just go out and you know, borrow and print another trillion dollars or, or whatever the number ends up being. Our number's not that high. But um, the good news in that front is that there are hundreds of billions of dollars that have been approved in previous bills, emergency bills, as they were described at the time. But the money doesn't get spent for years into the future. Why don't we repurpose that money for something that <clears throat> I think most Americans would think is very constructive, which is building out our infrastructure. So I think there's overlap. Uh, we'll have another iteration uh, between Republican senators and the White House this week, and we'll see if we can make progress. So let's start where you started with what is infrastructure? What yeah. do we include in, in the category? Is there any room for expansion there? For example, you didn't mention broadband. Do you think broadband should be included? Well, so I think you can make a case for broadband. I, I, you know, per, And there's some difference among Republicans on this. Uh, and, and partly it's because so much broadband has been built out by the private sector, right? We have, we have things that people think of as infrastructure that have historically been privately financed. The electric grid, for instance, the system of gas stations all around the country, broadband. We could decide to do some more to supplement that. Um, I think... Most Republicans are open to that. What about uh, education? What about preschool education? I mean, if, yeah, you go back, a, if you go back to after World War II, the GI yeah. Bill probably was one of the best investments we made in terms of human capital in this country. Isn't there a parallel there between that and preschool education? Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced the data is as overwhelming on preschool um, education. And it is certainly, in my mind, a separate category. It's a different conversation. We can have the debate. We should look at the data. We should, we should decide, is this a federal government responsibility? Is this a responsibility of state governments? Is it the responsibility of families? I mean, we, we can have that debate, but that's not the mechanism for moving goods and services. That's a different thing. How big do you think the bread box is? I understand you're not going to put a specific no, number on the yeah. table, but we have $600 billion on the table, for, yeah. and the prior from Shelley Moore Capito, yeah. some of your colleagues. Uh, we also have Mitch McConnell, the majority leader, minority leader, saying it could be $800 billion. Is that the sort of range you'd expect? You know, um, I, I, I don't want to get uh, too deep into the specifics, but I, I would say um, you're probably in the right ballpark. Let's talk about how you pay for it. Sure. Um, I've heard three different things. Taxes, user fees, and enhanced enforcement from the IRS. Let's take enhanced enforcement from the IRS first. Uh, how much money do you think is there? Do you agree that we should be spending more on auditing? Well, can I just say you left out what I think is the biggest category from this, which is repurposing money that's already been uh, determined to be spent but hasn't been spent yet. And let me give you an example of why I think that's such a, such a viable option. In 2020, the, the big, brutal pandemic year, contrary to almost all expectations, state and local governments in the aggregate took in more tax revenue than ever. 
set an all-time record in 2020. In addition to that, we sent them $500 billion of cash from the federal government for all kinds of purposes. And then, that was last year, along comes a new president, and President Biden insisted that we send them another $350 billion on top of all that. It's unbelievable. Mm. Most of it hasn't been spent yet. It's completely reasonable to ask these state and local governments that are sitting on piles of cash they never dreamed they literally. I mean, papers all across Pennsylvania tell stories of municipalities that are holding special meetings to say, what in the world are we going to do with all this money? How about kicking into the infrastructure? So, so I really think that's, a, that's an example of where there are hundreds of billions of dollars still unspent available for this purpose. You, of course, are a senator, but one of the reasons we love talking to you at Bloomberg is you also came off of Wall Street. You're a numbers guy. Yeah. Have you taken a pad out with a pencil to figure out how much money you think you could get out of that repurposed money as you describe it? Uh, we're working on that. One of the challenges we're having is getting uh, good, reliable figures on the spend out rate. So mm -hmm. when we authorize expenditures, um, often it takes several years for that to actually occur. It's easy to understand this, especially in the context of infrastructure where you could authorize, uh, I don't know, several billion dollars for bridges. Well, you've got to design them, you've got to plan them, you've got to get permits for them, so it takes a while to spend it. So the answer is we're working on that and we're refining that, but it is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, what about enforcement by the IRS? Are you in favor of that and how much money is there? Uh, if, if there are, I'm in favor of people paying what they owe. <laughs> so so if, if it is, and, and there's, there's a big range in the estimates of how much is owed but not actually being paid. And I think that if there's a good case to be made, we can justify that. You know, I will be candid with you about this. Uh, Republicans at some level are still a little bit scarred from the experience when some elements at the IRS, including in senior positions, weaponize their power to go after conservative groups. So we want to make sure that that sort of craziness doesn't happen. But if the exercise is ensuring that people pay what they actually owe, that's a legitimate exercise. You said one thing that's off the table as far as Republicans are concerned is repealing uh, the 2017 right. tax cuts. Is there room, though, for some increased revenue from taxes that does not constitute repealing the 2017 tax cuts? Um, if so, I can't think of what it is. I, I, I just don't think we want to go down that road. I don't think we need to. Um, I do think um, some various mechanisms for user fees are a completely legitimate way to pay for infrastructure. And one of the virtues of having uh, a mechanism, whether it's tolling a new road, for instance, or some other user fee, is you then create the possibility of attracting private capital because there's a return that's going to be tied to that project that's available to the investors. So. Um, some people might consider that taxes, I suppose, but I, I don't think of it that way. Um, that's that's a significant potential source of revenue. But if you put it all together, again, understanding we've got a long way to go before we get to real specifics. If, in fact, we're in a six to eight hundred billion dollar number, do you think between user fees and some money out of the IRS and repurposing that money, do you think you could pay for that kind of number? I think you could. Yeah, I think you could. I'm not sure we'll get to an agreement with the president, and our Democratic colleagues about how to do that. But I think those three categories are enough. There are some other ideas that are out there as well. People like the idea of an infrastructure bank yeah. and, and various other thoughts. But the answer is yes, I think there's enough to pay for this. What about timing? We hear that people are shooting to try to get something out by Memorial Day, by the end of this month. Is that realistic? That would be very difficult. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's coming. That's two weeks out. That's yeah. less than two weeks out. So I don't think it's like, that's my guess. Uh, but if we could get an agreement on the broad parameters, you know, how much we're going to spend, what are the categories, what are the categories for paying for it, then that would be huge progress. And in the next work period, uh, you know, before the 4th of July, it would be possible at least to, for something to come together. Let's talk about the economy overall. Uh, we've had an unprecedented series of events, first shutting the economy down right. and then bringing it back and, and with unprecedented monetary and fiscal support. At this point, the models that we've used sort of are to kilter. We can't predict what's going on. Where do you think we are right now? Because there's a lot of concern that with pumping all that money in, we may have inflation. Yeah, I'm very worried about that. Uh, the, um, the monetary policy is completely unprecedented. Uh, I mean, we had a, as you point out, right, the government shut down the economy to a very significant degree. The economy collapsed in the second quarter of last year. But in the third quarter, it came roaring back, 
And we are well on our way to a tremendous recovery, right? The economic growth is very strong. The argument for this calendar year is, is it six, seven, eight percent? You know, really numbers that we're not used to thinking about. And despite that, we have a Fed pursuing zero interest rate policy and buying $1.4 trillion worth of securities on an annualized basis, a combination of treasuries and, and agencies. I, I think it's long past time for the Fed to begin thinking about how and when they're going to, I guess, first taper the bond buying and then eventually normalize interest rates. And I'm worried that the paradigm they've set up almost guarantees that they're going to be behind the curve if inflation actually becomes problematic and persistent. Um, so this, this, yeah, this is a big concern of mine. There's the problem of what uh, the Fed's policies might do to the economy. There's also the problem of what perceptions it's creating, perceptions in the marketplace. Right. Uh, how do you make sure we don't have a so-called taper tantrum, but also inflation expectations in the population overall? As you know well, uh, if you could let the inflation expectations get out of control, you may have a big problem. Yeah, and you know, one of the uh, ongoing discussions I've had with the chairman is is the difference between um, the actual uh, monetary phenomenon. So I've always been sympathetic to Friedman's argument that inflation is a monetary mm -hmm. phenomenon, where others, including I think a lot of folks at the Fed, tend to think it's more a psychological phenomenon. In other words, it's about expectations. Well, I think it's more the former, but we're losing ground on the latter. Recent surveys are showing that the, the uh, consumers and businesses are increasingly expecting higher rates of inflation and for them to persist. The Fed has assured us that the current spike is going to be transitory. But one question that comes to mind is you can only know something is transitory after some period of time has elapsed and it hasn't, cha hasn't <laughs> ended, right? At which point you're behind the curve and as you point out, expectations may well have uh, become really entrenched that we're in for higher inflation. So that's what I mean when I say I'm concerned that the Fed is going to be behind the curve here. We have the U.S. economy, and we justify we are concerned about the U.S. economy, but we're also in competition globally. Right. And particularly, let me pick on China for a second, yeah. uh, the second largest economy rapidly catching up with the United States. Uh, are there things that Congress needs to do? I know that your co-sponsor of the bill with a Democratic colleague, uh, Senator Brown from Ohio, of something about sanctions with respect to some cyber issues with China. Uh, there's also the endless frontiers, which is to invest in us. What do we need to be doing, and what can Congress help us do to make sure we're competitive? <laughs> with China. So I think the most important thing is not to think that we're going to beat China by emulating China. And what I'm alluding to is the fact that they have a much more state-controlled economy than we do. And that's going to be, that already is, a liability for them. That's going to curb their potential for growth, in my view. They were always going to have spectacular growth coming from an extremely, extremely poor and low level of income once they introduced you know, the first sem semblances of a market economy. Um, but they have enormous inefficiencies. They have famous stories of entire cities of high-rise apartment buildings that are completely empty, misallocation of resources because it's driven by politics instead of by economics. So we shouldn't emulate that. We shouldn't try to centrally plan our economy, have the government decide which industries and which sectors should get more resources. Nobody will ever get that right. We've been winning for 200 years because we've never tried that. We've let the market figure this out. But what we can do is a better job of protecting our own intellectual property. That's our property, and nobody should be stealing our property. The Chinese have, the Chinese do, and we should be very tough about this. And this is one of the reasons why I'm absolutely astonished by the Biden administration decision to essentially allow the theft of a pharmaceutical intellectual property. This is... Mm -hmm. One of the crown jewels of, of American industry is our pharmaceutical. It's American companies that came up with the COVID vaccine and did it in an astonishingly brief period of time. And it's American vaccines that are the best in the world. The Chinese and Russians have tried, and they're not matching the performance of ours. And yet here we have an administration that's uh, talking about waiving the WTO rules that uh, forbid countries from taking this IP. It's... Um, it's very, very disturbing. Do you think it actually will happen, though, or is it more of a gesture, uh, a public gesture? Because you, the, in WTO, you're getting resistance from Angela Merkel and others. Not everybody's going along with this plan. Right. And, and you're right. It, and it takes unanimity at the WTO. So, but, but consider how strange it is that 
uh, American innovators are counting on the Germans to save us from an administration of our own with respect to our intellectual property. That's a bad place to be. And it sends a bad message to the people that we hope are going to invest in the next round of medicines and vaccines, and, which could include a vaccine for a variant of COVID. Who knows? Um, it sends a terrible message when the administration says, we're not interested in defending your ownership of your intellectual property. That was my conversation with Republican Senator Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania. You can hear more of the interview at Bloomberg.com.